announcements and reminders. Um, homework two has been on Canvas for a week now. Uh, you have one more week to get it done. Uh, this, this deals with uh, linear models and mistake-bound learning. And uh, you are implementing many, or at least four or five different versions of perceptron and uh, uh, you know playing with hyperparameters. This might take time for reasons that are very different from the previous homework. In this case, you're running a lot more experiments. So uh, please start soon if you haven't already. Uh, all the uh, technical material that we need to cover for the homework has been covered. So you should have everything you need to do the homework. Um, and of course, uh, I know that the Lot of discussion on Piazza. Keep going with that. And if there are questions, uh, please keep asking questions. Come to office hours. Are there any questions here that we can address? Um, I was wondering if there were any other places where you might have like examples for how to do something similar to question two. That would be struggling on which one's uh, question two? The uh, the, the, the uh, Transforming. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, there's a textbook, and I looked through that, but I was wondering if there was any other additional resources that I could find on those. Yeah, it's, it's, so uh, we can talk about it. Uh, um, we had a rather lively discussion about exactly this point in Office Arts uh, on Tuesday. And I can't think of any resources off the top of my head because it's a topic that almost is taken as a given. Uh, as a pre-processing step that you have to do just before you do get to the real machine learning. So uh, that said, though, let me give you a hint. Um, in that question, you have some function, and you are asked, can you come up with some transformation that makes it linear in the new state? So I'm not going to use that function as an example because uh, it's going to make things a little too obvious, but uh, let's say that I have some um, some sort of a, uh, I'll use the example that I used in office hours, um, and I'll try to keep it quicker than the 20 minutes it took me there. So imagine that my true concept is this circle here, and everything inside the circle is plus, and everything outside is minus. And let's say the equation of the circle is x1, this is x1 one, and this is x2. And let's say the equation of the circle is x1 square plus x2 square equals one. And so what this means is that uh, everything inside the circle will be positive and everything outside negative. That's the easy part. What I'm asking for is, this is the, the, the or let me put an app. This region is less than equal to one. Can you transform the space Somehow, and by that I mean, can you convert this expression into a new equation? I'm not going to tell you what it is. A new equation in, let's call it z1, z2, some, some, a bunch of z's, and you have to decide how many z's there are. And importantly, they should, according to the uh, uh, the requirements in the question, they should be strictly more than one, uh, such that. In the new space, I'm going to use an example of where you have exactly two of them. In the new space, let's say you have Z1 and Z2. There is a certain line that you can draw where all the points inside the circle are on one side of the line, all the points outside the circle are on the other side of the line. So the question that you're really asked is, can you convert, and, and the equation of this line is going to be some W1, Z1, plus W2, Z2. Well, we have only two of them here, so equals B. So less than B becomes positive, greater than B becomes negative. And at this point, if I say more, I would have to actually give you the answer. Uh, so I'm not going to say more. Think about this. Think the, the tricky part, and this is where you have to think about it, is to come up with some transformation of that expression there to make it look something like this, well, less than equal to b. And that means your transformation should be a function that takes x1, x2, 
and applies a function and produces the vector v1, v2, however many you have. And I'm not going to say more. Um, I'm, if I say more, I think uh, might as well just write an answer for you. Okay, other questions about the homework? Yes. Is it possible to have a state that can be put on the It would be very surprising. Um, of course, it's possible because the data tends, you know, it, it, it is. Uh, um, it's it, it, it is a statistical object, so there is a possibility that these things could happen, but I would be very surprised if that happens. Other questions? And since it's uh, dark in some parts of the room, I may not see your hand if you don't raise it too high. So if I don't see your hand, just, uh, just ask your question. Uh, there's a question. In 3.1, what do I mean by a sequence of examples? 3.1b, uh, is that the on, is that the mistake bound? Yeah. So what I mean by that is, uh, wait, is this the one that says uh, you need to find for any sequence of examples, it will make exactly one mistake? Um, is that 3.1b? Yeah, okay. So what I mean by that is, uh, there is a, in any mistake bound uh, learning setting, you're assuming that your learning algorithm operates on some sequence of example, uh, operates on one example at a time presented in the sequence. In that question, just like we saw with uh, the algorithms we saw in the class, right, with con and uh, uh, even the perceptron algorithm, the original perceptron algorithm, we don't get to control the order in which the examples are being presented. Nature controls the order of the examples. So, in any sort of a uh, theoretical framework that you have, you cannot make any assumptions about the examples showing up in any order. In particular, whatever you do must apply for any ordering of the examples, any sort of a theorem or a proof that you have, any, uh, uh, I don't want to make it sound grandiose, it's a rather simple proof actually, any uh, argument that you make should apply to any ordering of the examples. And that's what I mean by sequence of examples. Any way in which the examples are ordered uh, when they are presented to the uh, to the mistake bound uh, learner. Other questions? I have another uh, sort of an update on the projects. Uh, I've decided what your project will be. The data is still pre-processing. So hopefully I'll be able to, the pre-processing will get done by tonight. And I'll be able to post it. Otherwise, it will show up tomorrow. Uh, the ta the task is uh, you'll be th there is this uh, um, project in the, in England called the Old Bailey Project, which tries to uh, which is kind of co collected data from the this court in England and Wales called Old Bailey um, from. For a period of about 200 years, from 1600 to 18-ish, I can't remember the dates. And uh, you know, we have the full transcript of the of the of the trial. And at the end of the trans of end of the trial, there's a decision that's made whether the the defendant was judged guilty or not. So your task is you'll be given the transcript of the trial without the judgment, and you'll have to decide your classifier has to decide given the transcript. Was it a guilty judgment or not? Um, and uh, this is some painting of Old Bailey that I saw in here. And um, to kind of save you from all the NLP part of this, we are going to we have already pre-processed. Uh, that's the pre-processing that's running right now. Uh, we have done the feature extraction. We are converting all that the, the transcript into finite size feature vectors that we'll be working with. There'll be multiple different feature vectors that you'll, be, you'll have access to. And uh, in addition, you'll also have metadata about who's the defendant, their age, their gender, and some other uh, uh, details that I'm forgetting right now. And so this is going to, this is the task that you'll be working on for the entirety of the semester for your project. One good thing is for your project, you'll be submitting on Kaggle, you'll be submitting the predictions of your models on a set of examples for which 
we don't show you the labels and tagger will evaluate the correctness of your uh, predictions. The good news is that uh, all the code that you write for your homeworks, you might be able to repurpose for this problem because you know you, you have to submit the uh, the predictions from at least six different algorithms. You have to implement them on your own. That's what you're doing for your homework anyway. So the effort that you spend on your homework can actually be um, so multiple uh, uh, purposes. You might be able to re revisit those algorithms once again for the project. The one deadline that's coming up, or the milestone that's coming up, uh, is it one week? Probably a little more than one week. So uh, a little over one week away um, is uh, the first milestone. It's a very simple milestone that's mostly there for bookkeeping. Um, we'll, you'll find a link on Canvas. So you join the, 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 the project on Kaggle, and there'll be a, 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 some, a, an archive that an archive file, a zip file or something that you download. And zip that, download this uh, all positive submission that's available, that's going to be there on Kaggle or Canvas. I'm not sure where I'll put it. And download it. It has the right format for all your future submissions. So you just upload that file back to Kaggle to see if this you're able to submit with your account. If it works, that's good. And uh, no doubt, Kaggle will the way you know it works is Kaggle will give you an accuracy for your submission. And uh, this is the all positive submission, which means that this is a, a file where every single instance, in this case, an instance is a trial. Every single instance is judged as label one. I forget if label one is guilty or not guilty. Um, so you get this accuracy on on Kaggle, now you go back to Canvas, you fill out a small form that you, like a quiz type form that you have, with just two questions. What's your Kaggle user ID? And what's the accuracy of the dummy submission that you get from Kaggle? Okay, this should not take you too long. It took me longer to describe it than it might be for you to actually do this work. Um, uh, and you have till the 20th of February for this. Uh, there will be other milestones that uh, will, will show up and I'll, uh, the, the PDF associated with the project it, it gives you more details. Any questions about the project? Yes. Yes. It will be supervised learning. So all the stuff that you're doing in the class for the homework and everything will apply directly. And I'm also not giving you the raw text for the thing because uh, if I do, then the labels for the hidden files, the evaluation files is also available. So that kind of defeats the purpose. I mean, I'm assuming that nobody has so much time that they're going to go through thousands of examples and manually just copy over the label, but why this? Why even give you the opportunity? Uh, so you don't you will only be working with features and metadata. Other any questions? Any other questions? If there are none, let's uh, dive into where we left things off. Oh, there's a question. Yes. You can use a external frame like Python. Um, oh, that's a good question. So you'll have to make six submissions on uh, on Kaggle. Six official. I mean, typically people have like 20, 30 submissions because they're just kind of trying things out. You have to mark six of them as official. Among those six official submissions, no more than one can use an external library. Five of them should be with machine learning algorithms that you have implemented from scratch, just like for the homeworks. And the details, there's like a more, there are like a few other constraints with how you what you can submit, and all those all that information will be in the uh, project description. Okay, let's pick up with perceptron. No, let's go back to the question. Sorry, uh, is there a great speed software like IS accuracy or? Um, no. So the grade will not be based on your highest accuracy. There's a leaderboard that Kaggle has that puts people, that ranks people. I'm not going to use the leaderboard to assign a grade to you. Uh, you'll be, remember I told you you'll be running six algorithms, right? And, you know, let's say, let's just use an example. Let's say that uh, you one of your six algorithms is the average perceptron. And I expect that many of you will use average perceptron. And I have a sense of how much average perceptron should get on this, on, on this data. Um, 
So if you are within like one standard deviation of your average per, of the average perceptron expectation, then you don't lose points. Otherwise, you lose points that you go further away. Meaning you lose points if your average perceptron does much, much worse than other average perceptrons. You also lose points if it does surprisingly too well, because how could it, it doesn't have a capacity. Uh, and similar, so basically you, every algorithm will be put in its own equivalent class. Um, I don't really care about getting to the top of the leaderboard. If you're interested, later on after the semester is over, I can share the full data and you can try to game the whole system. But for now, uh, I, I'm, I'm more interested in you getting the algorithms right. And the goal of this project is um, in some sense, you get to play with data and make critical choices like what algorithms you pick. How do you pre-process the data? How do you pre-process the features? Um, you can you have the freedom to do whatever you want. How do you set up cross-validation? Um, any sort of feature transformation? All those decisions, which we kind of give you in the homework and we ask you to do those things, but in the project, you're free to do whatever you want. Other questions? Okay. So we're going back to the perceptron. In the last lecture, we looked at the perceptron algorithm. And we also looked at the variant, some variants of perceptron. Um, there's another question on Canvas. And the other milestones are related to this data set as well. That's right. Uh, the, the entire semester from now on for that project alone, for the project, it will be all on this data set. All the milestones will be for this data set. Um, so the perceptron algorithm is a rather simple algorithm. Uh, at least the, the core of it is very, very simple. It's an online algorithm, which means that uh, there's a sequence of examples that comes in. The algorithm operates on only one example at a time. And for any example, let's call it Xi, Let's say the current set of weights are W. An example XI comes in, and the algorithm makes a prediction for this example. That means it looks at the sign of, of W transpose XI. I'm going to write the bias term explicitly here just because it's there. And I occasionally want to just remind you that it's always there. So it makes a prediction. And then the example also is associated with, with the true label. So then the algorithm checks if yi, the true label, is not equal to y prime, the prediction. Then you have the perceptron update, which is w is w plus r yi xi. This is the entirety of the algorithm. And uh, it has this sort of a neat geometric interpretation. Um, and the, the, the intuition behind the update is that Every time it makes a mistake, the weights are essentially sort of located, and uh, the amount, the, the 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 way in which the weight vector, the, the the hyperplane is rotated, is by adding a positive example if it's a mistake on a positive example, and by subtracting a negative example if it's a mistake on a negative example. So in a loose sense, the final weight vector will look like the sum of the positive examples minus the sum of the negative examples. Um, it's not exactly right, but uh, in, in, a, in a loose sense, that's, uh, that's roughly what's happening. I only presented an intuition for why this might work. I did not actually say why this is actually a good idea. Why uh, the perceptron algorithm uh, you know, is correct in the sense of it actually learns under some model of learning. We're going to cover that point now. In particular, we're going to analyze the perceptron algorithm under the mistake bound model. So we're going to de derive, I'm going to state and prove the perceptron mistake bound. The perceptron algorithm has been really well studied, and there are a couple of uh, theorems associated with it, uh, which I'll first describe in a loose sense. There's a the convergence theorem. This is what we'll end up proving formally. It turns out that if there are a set of weights, there exists a set of weights that are consistent with the data. What that means is if there is some weight vector, not one that we have access to, there's some weight vector that perfectly separates the positive and the negative examples. In other words, the data is linearly separable. 
then the first electron algorithm will converge. By converge, I mean it will, it will reach a point where it will make no more updates to the weight vector. That's the convergence theorem. There's also the cycling theorem, which is like the opposite of that. If it turns out that a data set is not linearly separable, then there is a set of weights that the perceptron algorithm will cycle through. It will keep changing forever. It will never converge. It will keep making mistakes and it will keep cycling through a set of weights. I'll not be proving the second theorem. I'll talk about the first one in some detail. Now, before we uh, talk about the theorem itself, uh, let's talk about the learnability of uh, the, the learnability properties of the perceptron. Remember that the perceptron operates on weight factors. It tries to train a linear classifier, which means, of course, it's only going to learn a linear classifier. If the hypothesis space for the perceptron is a, the set of all linear classifiers, then of course, at the end, it's going to produce a linear classifier, right? That, that makes, I hope that's kind of trivially true. So it can only, at best, it can only learn linearly separable functions. It turns out this was, while it seems like it's a trivial statement, um, it took some time for this to sink in. The perceptron algorithm was introduced in 1958, and uh, uh, almost a decade later, there was this uh, uh, book by Martin Minsky and Seymour Spafford uh, called Perceptrons, which is a very influential book. It was one of the early attempts for using geometry to study machine learning. And uh, through these sorts of geometric arguments, the, this book demonstrated the limitations of the perceptron. And it was it, it's actually a very clever book that, uh, that goes through a lot of technical stuff. But in particular, some of the points that this book uh, raised is the perceptron cannot learn the parity function. Why? Because the parity function, the simplest version being XOR in two dimensions, is not linearly separable. But of course, the perceptron is not going to learn a function that is not linearly separable because it can only learn things that are linearly separable. Now, while that may seem of like trivially uh, true, there are a lot of interesting functions, a lot of interesting properties in nature are behave like parity. They are not linearly separable. So, for instance, uh, the notion of symmetry. If you have two things and you want, a, if you have two objects and you say that this one looks like that, that's essentially like a parity function. And it's, uh, you know, in a certain technical sense, it requires some uh, some sort of an XOR type property. So those kinds of properties cannot be learned with the perceptron, with just the simple perceptron that we just saw. Any questions about this sort of high level arguments that I've been making so far. I've not proved anything. I'm just making a high level argument that the perceptron cannot learn something that's not linearly separable. And then I did mention the, the two properties. If something's linear, it cannot learn something that's not linearly separable. But on the other hand, if something, if a data set, if a task, if a concept is linearly separable, the perceptron is guaranteed to learn. And that's the theorem that we'll prove next. Yes. How is a function is linearly separable? The type of function is that how to what's the connection between the the law and symmetry? Um, you know that's a point I don't want to get into because it's a sort of a detail that uh, will take us into a rabbit hole. But XOR behaves in the following way: you have uh, Notice that XR is true only if the two inputs are the same. Mm. And that's like a symmetry property. There's symmetry between the two features. Mm. And so you need you, you need uh, uh, something that is not linearly separable for uh, to address that. Uh, there's a question on Zoom. What are local features? I just mean by that they're just features. For now, just say features. OK. To introduce the perceptron uh, mistake bound, I need to introduce an, a very important concept uh, called margin. Margin is a property of uh, a data set. And uh, 
the, it, it's this geometric property that allows us to reason about whether a hyperplane is good. And among different hyperplanes that are equally good at separating, uh, that are that are per, that perfectly separated data sets, it allows us a way to rank one over the other. Let me introduce this in uh, in this with this uh, two dimensional example. Imagine that you have this data set here with pluses and minuses. The margin of this data set with respect to that hyperplane there is simply uh, the distance between the closest data point, this one here, and the hyperplane. So you can I can write this as if I have a data set D, which consists of say xi and yi. So I want that the distance of the hyperplane, let's call that W, W comma XI, and I want the minimum of all the XI. And you know, this is simply the distance between a line and a plane, or sorry, a line and a point, or in high dimensions, a plane, a hyperplane, and a point. Hopefully, uh, this is kind of giving you memories of homework zero, where some questions ask you to measure the distance between a point and a plane. Mm -hmm. So the margin of a hyperplane and a data, a data set is simply the distance of the closest data point to that hyperplane. But really, the more interesting uh, from version of margin, the more interesting property here is the margin of a data set. And it's usually denoted by this letter gamma. The margin of a data set is among all the hyperplanes that exist that can perfectly separate a data set, the largest value of the margin. So, so you see, you have these two hyperplanes here, right? There's this, the red line that I'm drawing, and its margin is this distance here. And then there's the blue line, let's call this line A and B. The B, the distance from B to the closest point is this gap here, which is equal to this gap here, because I put B back right in the middle. So B is further, perfectly separates the data point and is further away from any single data point than A. So B has a larger margin than A. That we say that B has a larger margin than A. The margin of the data set is the margin of, is the largest margin of all hyperplanes that can separate the data. Before we move on to uh, any more detail, ask me questions. Yes. The, we are assuming here that the data is linearly separable. So um, the margin is only uh, 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 computed or is margin is only defined for linearly separable data sets. And the margin is also only def is defined by uh, conceptually by enumerating every possible hyperplane and finding that perfectly separates the data and finding the one that has the largest margin. Yes. So if we can calculate the margin of the data set, does that not mean that we already know the best line of the set in there? Yes. If we know the margin, well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, uh, technically, I would say yes. But let's just uh, assume that there's an oracle that just tells you the margin of the data for now. And in the theorem that we'll be proving, I'll be treating the, we, the theorem will involve the margin. And it's the sort of a conceptual object that we assume we have access to without access to the perfect separate. Yeah. It's still kind of like it's in the center. It will be in the center. The margin will be in the center because if it is not in the center, you can always yeah. move it a little bit and increase the margin. Yeah. Because if you want the closest data point, it doesn't say the closest positive or negative point. Yeah. Um, we are assuming it, it's perfectly separable. There's a question on Zoom. In the example on the slide, wouldn't a line going straight up have a larger margin? Uh, I I don't know. I mean, let's try. Maybe. So maybe a line like this. Possibly. Um, I mean, this is. I have not really drawn this example. Uh, 
it, this is PowerPoint art. So it's about as, uh, um, yeah, it's not necessarily my, it, it's an artist's impression of margin. But it's possible that there might be another line that has a larger margin. And the margin of the data set, to define the margin of the data set, I need to find, I need to enumerate every possible um, example. Sorry, any, every possible uh, hyperplane. Okay. In, now that you're all expert on the idea of a margin of a data set, let's now look at the, let's just dive into this mistake bound theorem. The mistake bound theorem came about, uh, it, it, it was proved independently by two people, Novikov and Bloch, Novikov in the Soviet Union, Bloch in the US. And uh, I'm going to first state the mistake bound theorem and then we'll start interpreting it and then we'll prove it. So suppose we have a sequence of examples that are presented to the perceptron learner. Each example looks like the pair xi comma yi. Xi, each xi is a n-dimensional vector here. Each xi belongs to Rn. Each yi can either be minus one or one. So far, I've told you nothing new. This is just, I have n features, um, and the labels are, uh, it's a binary classification task, you have minus one or one. The one sort of an extra bit that I'm adding here is each xi, the norm of the vector xi, xi is a vector, right? It's a 10 dimensional vector. I can think of the norm of that vector, which is simply the length, the distance of that vector from the origin. Each xi has a norm less than or equal to r. What that means is that uh, the, the way to think about this, imagine that each you can think of the data points being in some three-dimensional space. Maybe they all lie here. They're not even centered. Mm -hmm. I can think of a large circle in this space, or you can think of a large sphere in three dimensions, or in higher dimensions, it's a hypersphere. The general trick is, if you go above three dimensions, you add the word hyper there. Uh, so I can think of a large circle that contains all the points. Mm. That's the so it's basically there is given that your data set all your features are finite, there must be some large circle that contains all the data points, right? Let's name the radius of that circle. Let's call it R. So we can always find an R. Just look for the farthest point from the origin and the distance of that point from the origin is the radius of that circle. So it's really not an assumption as much as it's a property of the data. Okay, so I, I told you nothing about the theorem yet. This is just the setup. This is the space in which, this is the context in which the theorem operates. Now, now comes the assumption. Every theorem, no matter what you have, every theorem, has the following sort of a form. If some properties hold, then some other properties hold. Every theorem is basically a statement of that kind. Mm -hmm. So now let's come to the if part. Suppose there's a unit vector u, uh, which is like a weight vector, and some positive number gamma, gamma is your margin, so gamma is greater than zero, such that for every example xi, yi, you have this property why u transpose xi is greater than equal to gamma. Can someone tell me what this means? Because this is just a horrible sentence with a lot of symbols. But can someone tell me what this means in simple English? Yes. Yes. That's right. So this part is the what I call the score associated with that example. And yi is the true label. Okay. So far, so good. Let me kind of walk you through the sentence because it's written to confuse almost. Remember, what is what's the notion of a mistake? The perceptron or any linear classifier, right? Remember, I told you in the last lecture, when I have some weight vector w, I can take the w transpose xi. I always assume there's a bias factor. I'm not showing a bias. Mm -hmm. W transpose 
I don't need an I. Let's say W transpose X. The, the prediction is this quantity here, the sign. And let's say this is not equal to, let me put an I, is not equal to I. Let's say the prediction is not equal to the ground. I can write exactly that statement more compactly as an inequality by saying Y I W transpose X I is less than zero. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So the only time Y I and X I will have the Y I W transpose X I will be less than zero is if Y I and W transpose X I have opposite signs, which means the prediction will not be equal to the ground. Mm -hmm. So this represents a mistake for a linear classifier. Also, in other words, what does it mean for that particular weight not to have made a mistake? That just means why i w transpose x i is strictly greater than zero. Mm -hmm. I'm not a, I let's ignore the case where it's equal to zero. That's just a weird uh, edge case which we don't have to worry about. This means no mistake. If it is greater than zero strictly. There must be some positive number for which it's greater than or equal to that number, right? It's greater than zero. So point one is greater than zero, but point one is greater than or equal to point one. Mm -hmm. Then if it is greater, so greater than zero just means that it's somewhere to the side. It is this somewhere on that. Let's give that number a name. That number, let's call it instead of greater than zero, I'm going to call it greater than equal to gamma. That's just saying yi w transpose xi is at least some positive number gamma. Just another way of saying there's no mistake on that example. Mm -hmm. Instead of w transpose xi, let's put a u here. My u's and w's look very similar, so mm -hmm. that's probably not very helpful. Yeah. So this can say on this particular example, there's no mistake. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to that statement. For every example x i y i, there exists some u and some positive gamma such that u w transpose x i. No, y u transpose x i is greater than or equal to gamma. There is some number gamma such that y u transpose x i is always greater than that, and that number is positive, which means there is a single weight vector that makes no mistake on every single example that can exist. Just as a matter of uh, convenience, I'm assuming that the weight vector, that that particular vector has a uh, unit now. Well, that's just for, so that we don't have to carry that around later on in the theorem. Mm -hmm. What this statement really says is that, exactly, this is just a complicated way of saying that this data is linearly separable. There is some weight vector. We don't have access to that weight vector. There's some weight vector u, and there's some number gamma such that why i u transpose x i is always greater than gamma, which means it's that particular weight vector perfectly separates every single example, uh, perfectly assigns the correct label to every single example. In other words, even though I don't have access to the weight vector by this statement, I know that this data is linearly separable. This is just a complicated but precise way of saying the concept that we that we want our learner to learn is a linearly separable concept. Any question? Yes. The big R is this radius. It's a real number. Um, it's this quantity, this thing, right? It's this radius of, it's the, basically the distance of the farthest point from the R. We are assuming that there's a giant circle that contains all the points and R is simply the radius of that. So all I've said here is that using the yes. That's basically it. The unit vector just says that the weight vector is normal. In fact, this sentence is actually saying a little bit more than the fact that the data is separable by saying that every single uh, example has y u transpose x i greater than gamma. This is equivalent to saying that the the data has a margin gamma. 
using the frame rotation as uh, using the idea of margin that I just described. The data is linearly separable and the data has a margin gamma. Now, the margin behaves like a complexity parameter. It's a natural. Um, so there's a question, is the margin not allowed to be zero? If so, why? The margin, if, if the margin is allowed to be zero, that just means that the uh, let's think about what the margin is. The margin is simply the the maximum margin among all hyperplanes uh, for this data set. So for every among every hyperplane, we consider what's the closest point, and the maximum value among that. If that is zero, that means there is some point that lies exactly on the separating hyperplane, and let's that, that's a that's just an uh, uh, the, the the only way that can happen is if you have a positive and a negative point that lies something like this, and there's no way to actually separate the the data um, uh, without putting the point on the on the hyperplane. So let's not go into that edge case. But more uh, generally, we'll assume that the margin is non-zero, uh, is strictly positive, and it's it's not so much an assumption as it's think of it as part of the definition. It's, it's a part of the definition that of linear separability. Um, so let's see, what was I saying? So the margin is a complexity parameter. And by that, I mean, larger margins make learning easier. Smaller margins make learning harder. And the way to think about that is, suppose you have, and this, this point we'll come back to in more detail later on. Suppose you have two data sets, that look like this. This is, let's say, data set one, where the pluses are here and the minuses are here. And there's another data set that looks like this. It, you would argue, you probably agree when I say that let's call this data set A and B. A is more difficult than B because there's only a little gap between the positive and the negative, whereas here there's a lot of room. So even if you just accidentally draw a hyperplane, you might end up separating the positives and the negatives. Whereas if you accidentally draw a hyperplane, it's not going to work. So you are more, it's possible to get more lucky in the in data set B than data set A. B has a larger margin. So larger margins make learning easier. And so that makes the idea of a margin a uh, good sort of a complexity parameter that indicates the difficulty of the concept. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go back to the mistake bound theorem. So far, I've not told you what the theorem is. Yes. Right. That's on that slide. Well, this is somewhat off topic, but if you find a line that separates the data, then you then want to turn the line down to find the margin. If you find a hyperplane that separates the data, and let's say you're using the perceptron algorithm, will the perceptron algorithm make any more updates after that? Why not? Exactly. So if the perceptron only makes updates if there are mistakes. If the if you found a hyperplane that perfectly classifies the data and maybe you just found one that's not a doesn't have a great margin, you're out of luck because the perceptron will not make any more updates because the example is perfectly separable. On the other hand, the margin perceptron, which uh, is also in your homework, might make mistakes because it says it's not enough that I separate the data, I need to have examples outside this sort of margin of safety and only to I'm going to keep up making updates till that happens. Okay, let's uh, look at the statement of the theorem finally. So the first part there says we have some examples that are with n features and we have a binary classification task. And there's this number r that, uh, that defines a circle that contains all the data points. The second block says my task is linearly separable with a margin gamma. If this happens, then the theorem says the perceptron algorithm will make no more than r square over gamma square mistakes on any training sequence. So this is kind of an amazing result. It says it doesn't matter which order you present the examples. After making r square over gamma square mistakes, 
the perceptron algorithm would have found a perfectly a, a, a linear classifier that perfectly separates them. So if you want, like, is there a question? Yes. Is there any relationship between the margin of the hyperplane and the margin of the data set? The margin of the data set is the margin of the the largest margin of among all hyperplanes. So if you want to kind of uh, 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 get into the, you know, uh, convert this sentence, this theorem into plain English, it says, suppose we have a binary classification task with n dimensional inputs. If the data set is linearly separable, then perceptron will find a separator after making a, only a finite number of mistakes. The rest of it is just math. The perceptron algorithm will stop making mistakes, and we know exactly how many mistakes it will make, r square over gamma square. Of course, this assumes that we have access to gamma, which is a conceptual object which we don't have access to. But uh, at least it tells us that uh, uh, the, the number of mistakes is going to be finite. Uh, there's like one sort of a technical detail. I said the unit, the weight, the the, the vector u that perfectly can separate the data is a unit vector. If it was not a perfect uh, unit vector, then you'll have this norm of u that you'll have to carry around in the mistake bound. And the reason you assume it's a unit vector is so that you don't have to keep writing that all the time. Any questions about the statement of this theorem? We haven't proved anything. Yes. It doesn't. Perceptron is uh, at least the original version of the perceptron, not the standard one that we usually implement. The original version of the perceptron is a mistake driven algorithm. It's an online algorithm. We can't make, in all of this uh, online algorithms, we can't make any assumptions about the order in which examples are presented. Another way of saying that is we have to live with the fact that in certain situations, the examples might be presented in the absolutely worst order. And yet, this will stop making mistakes after R square over gamma square. Yeah. Um, that's right. In fact, uh, there are certain other versions in which you see this. There are other, uh, um, you know, yes, that's right. But if you move the data points around, you're shrinking the points, right? By doing that, you'll also be reducing gamma. So you don't get anything for free. Then. So there are versions of this exact theorem where you don't, the assumption is the data points are they lie in the unit circle. In the unit sphere, there the mistake bound would be one over gamma square. But that just means that the new gamma in that compressed thing will contain the original R, but it's just hidden from the notation. Just like the U that I kind of hid away by uh, making the unit vector, the, 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 you know, just like what I did here, I, I got rid of U by making U a unit vector. So it's exactly the same concept. Other questions? Is this saying that you learn faster when you keep your weight vector normalized? Notice here that I'm not actually doing any normalization to, this is not saying anything about the unit vector, sorry, about the, the, the weight vector that you're learning. U is this sort of a conceptual object that is the perfect separator. It, think of it as the true concept, the concept that we wish to learn. We, we assume that that is normalized. But the actual mistake bound is for the original perceptron algorithm, um, which will prove, and the, the proof does not really require that the weight vector is normalized. Another question, does this mean that the order of the data does not matter since R is always the same? Yeah, at least for the mistake bound, the order in which the examples are presented does not matter. One of the ways to kind of... Uh, when you see a new theorem, you need to first savor it and appreciate it for what it is um, before you jump into the proof. The proof might just be mechanics. It's just kind of detailed, uh, low-level details that uh, that's kind of actually not terribly hard. But the implication of this theorem is kind of cool. 
-hmm. It doesn't matter what the task is, as long as it's linearly separable. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, what order in the, the 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 examples are presented. Mm -hmm. Nature could be adversarial. Nature could present the example, could choose the worst example that triggers a mistake every single time. Yet, if the data is linearly separable, the hand of nature is tied. It cannot play that game of forcing an adverse being adversarial after forcing R square over gamma square inches, which is kind of cool. I mean, it, it, this this does not really this, this makes so few assumptions about the concept, other than the fact that it's linearly separable. This took uh, the, the mistake bound, if you notice, was from 1962. It took a few years after the algorithm was published for the mistake bound to show up. But actually, this, core, this the, the, the core idea was known in the early 50s because this algorithm, the perceptron algorithm, was originally not presented as a machine learning algorithm, but as a technique for discovering whether a certain collection of points are linearly separable or not. Because if you have a collection of points and you want to know whether they are linearly separable, well, run this algorithm. If it stops making mistakes, you know it's linearly separable. Um, so this was presented as an algorithm for discovering linear separability. Um, and I think that literature kind of got buried. And uh, then it, the, the same idea was reborn as perceptron. Um, there's a question. You're raising your hand for the question, right? Yeah. Um, can overfitting ever happen with linear separate uh, with linear uh, models? Of course it can, um, because when overfitting uh, assume, you know what is overfitting? Overfitting just means that there is a classifier. There's a different classifier that the learner did not find that is better than the one that your learner actually found. There's a simple example of overfitting that I can give for perceptron uh, using that picture that I do just now. Um, in this data set B, I would argue that the line that I have drawn, or the line like thing that I have drawn, actually has overfit the data because it is too close to this positive example. A better separator might be something like this, which has a larger mark. So, overfitting can happen with uh, linear classifiers. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The it doesn't matter which order the examples are presented, because after these many mistakes, there will be no more mistakes. So it is possible that um, your nature is adversarial in a sneaky way. It calculates R square over gamma square and forces the algorithm to make these many minus one mistakes and then presents a bad, and then does not hold up, present the next bad example. We know that there's going to be one more mistake in the future. We just don't know when it will happen. We, but that's true for all mistake bond algorithms. Right, the number is the, the because the game we are playing here is to we are defining learnability as uh, stop making mistakes. We don't say when the mistake will happen. Okay, so now let's prove this theorem. Um, just to remind you, I, I, I have the mechanics of the algorithm on the box on the top. The setting is, uh, let's say that we have an initial weight vector, which is set to all zero. Um, let's say that the learning rate is one. Learning rate could be any number R, but if you have, if you choose, a, uh, if you have R, then you'll have to carry that along in your uh, proof. Let's just make the learning rate R. Um, and all, we, we, by the statement of the theorem, we know that all examples are contained in this large ball of radius R, which means that for any xi, yi, the norm of xi is less than or equal to r. And this is by the condition in the theorem. We also know from the condition in the theorem that the data is linearly separable using a unit vector u, which means that we have this property here. yi, u transpose xi, is greater than or equal to gamma, 
for every x i y i. This is just a summary of what we know or what we are doing. The proof is really it proceeds in three parts. The first part step is that uh, we first prove that after making three mistakes, the product of the dot product of u, the, the true weight vector, and w, which we are learning, will be greater than t times the margin gamma. The general, before we go into the details of this, the way the proof works is we'll prove that we, we will continue, we'll uh, uh, monitor this quantity u transpose w, which is simply the dot product of the true vector u and the learned vector w. At this for this object, this quantity changes as learning proceeds because w keeps changing. So if you think of dot product as like a uh, like a, it's almost like a cosine. Uh, as w changes, if this dot product becomes larger and larger, that means that w is getting closer and closer to u. Because cosine, as it gets larger and larger, the cosine of zero which is the angle between them, cosine of zero equals one. Mm -hmm. So if the angle between them becomes zero, then we, the uh, dot product will become uh, large, except for one problem. That's only true if your two vectors are unit vectors. U is a unit vector, which is clear, W is not. So the first part of the theorem says, this dot product will keep getting larger and larger. So you have, let's say this is U, and originally this would be W. This is the angle that called some, and then W keeps changing. It gets closer and closer. But the norm of the weight vector W might. So all this statement says is U transpose W T keeps increasing as the number of mistakes increases. There's another. The second step of this proof says, at the same time, the norm of W keeps decreasing. That means the only or uh, the norm of W is bound. That means the only way in which this can these two properties can hold together is if uh, after a point you stop making. It. If this sort of a high level argument didn't make sense, let's just step through the mechanics and try to interpret this as we go along. So the first claim is after t mistake, u transpose W D is going to be greater than or equal to t gamma. What is um, and I know that I made a half by one error with my subscript index here, the T, but uh, the, it doesn't change the, the proof in, in any material sense. So let's look at the update here. WT plus one is WT plus YI XI. So let me multiply the both sides. Let me take the dot product of both sides with U. So you transpose this is equal to you transpose that. That's what I've written on top. So you transpose W T plus one is you transpose W T plus Y I you transpose X I. Now, what do we know about Y I you transpose X I? U is the true weight vector, right? That perfectly classifies this example X I Y I. What we know from the statement from the assumptions that we had was for any xi yi, yi times u transpose xi is at least gamma. Mm. So I can bring that piece of information. This quantity is greater than or equal to gamma. So I can bring that in. So u transpose wt plus one is u transpose wt plus gamma. This is a this is the transition from the teeth mistake to the teeth plus one mistake. But this quantity here is greater than u transpose w t minus one plus gamma by itself. By I'm just applying the same argument again, plus another gamma this goes here. Mm -hmm. So this is greater than or equal to this. And I can keep you know chaining this argument all the way down u transpose w zero plus this greater than or equal to gamma plus gamma plus gamma all, for all of these things that keep coming down. Mm -hmm. But we know that W0 is by assumption zero. 
So u transpose w zero is just v zero. So we are left with just t plus one gammas. This, this is just straightforward induction. And by just chaining all of these together, what we get is u transpose w t is greater than or equal to t times gamma. Mm -hmm. Questions? And uh, the, I, I was at some talk once where they said, the worst way to learn math is to watch somebody else presenting it on a slide. So if this is, you know, in some sense, the situation that we are in is absolutely the worst way for you to learn math. The best way to do it is for you to do it on your own. So I encourage you to kind of think, you know, not just try to absorb it by me talking about it, but work it out on your own, because that otherwise it, it's, Hard for it to take care of. But to help with that, are there any questions? I'm assuming everyone got it. Or is this just stunned silence? Or do you want me to go over some step again? Okay, one person not know, so I'm going to assume that as the representative for the entire class. That's the first part of the proof. The second part of the proof is, uh, is this, in the first step, we, sh we talked about this angle between U and W. Next, let's just talk about the length of the weight vector W. The claim here is after T mistakes, the norm of W, the square norm of W is going to be less than T times R square. The steps are essentially going to be very, very similar. So let's look at WT plus 1 is WT plus YI XI. Right? That's just the, after T mistakes, after the T mistake, you just made this update to get the new weight back. That's how you constructed WT plus 1. So let's take the norm of WT plus 1. So you get the norm square and the norm square. The thing on the right side is just a perfect square. I can expand the square. So this is nothing but wt square plus yi xi square plus 2 Y i x i. I just expanded the square, and uh, because w and x are vectors, and y is a number, I can move the y out here, and uh, it, it becomes the, the middle term becomes uh, two times w t transpose x i. Any questions about what I've done here? If you don't like my handwriting, you're in luck. I have it nicely typed. Mm -hmm. So you have WT plus one is simply WT square, oh, oh. simply WT square plus XI square. Notice that wow. here the Y disappeared. Why? Because YI is either minus one or plus one. And I take a square of it, it's just going to be a one. So you have XI square here. And then you have two yi, wt transpose x i. Mm -hmm. Let's now examine these uh, these terms one at a time. Let's ignore the first one because that's how we're going to build up our the, the recursion. Let's first look at this thing. What can we say about x i square? The norm of x i square. R square. It's strictly less than it's less than or equal to r square. Yeah. Why? Because we assume that our data points lie in this giant ball of size r. This is just a square. Uh, uh, length of that vector. So this quantity is less than equal to r square. Yeah. What can we say about this thing here? So that will actually go into it. Um, maybe you shouldn't say it. <laughs> Someone else. What can you tell me about why i? Why is it negative? 
That's right. Why did this update even happen? Why did we want to change WT? We wanted to change WT because a mistake happened. What does it mean to say that a mistake happened? A mistake is defined as Y W transpose X is less than zero. Mm -hmm. This is exactly that point here. Y I W transpose X I. On this example, this particular weight vector made a mistake. So this quantity is less than zero. This quant so does that does that seem right? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, there are multiple nodding heads, so this must be very clear. On the other hand, there was someone who told me that uh, when I was uh, early in my when I started teaching, someone said if three or four people say they understand, that doesn't mean that the class understands, because chances are the people who don't understand are very shy to ask. So and if you do actually ask a question, you'll be doing everyone else who's shyer than you a lot big favor. So ask questions. There is a question. So if there is a two yi and yi is minus one, couldn't that middle term be positive? So let's examine this quantity here. So the question is, I claim this is negative, but y i is either plus one or minus one. And the question is, if it's a, um, if it's a, could the middle term not be positive because y i could be plus one? The answer is, it's not y i that's plus one or minus one. It's really the product of y i and this quantity that is that I claim is always going to be negative because if it was, if y i is plus one, and W transpose Xi was positive, in which case the product is positive, you would have never triggered an update because the sign of W transpose Xi and, and Yi are the same. Similarly, if Yi was minus one and W transpose Xi was negative, you would have never triggered an update. The only reason this update came into existence was because Yi and W transpose Xi have opposite signs, which means this product here is strictly negative. So the the two does not really matter because multiplying a negative number by two will make it negative. So we have W transpose WT square plus some this quantity here is the you know we have this negative less than here, less than here. So this means this makes it plus zero plus half square, and I can put a less than here. Yeah. I'm just moving those terms down. And once again, no, because this is actually, I, this is the okay. case. Because it was a mistake. They are opposite signs. They are, it's strictly negative. Mm -hmm. So it's strictly negative. Uh, uh, less than. Okay. So we have, we, so the, the middle term is mm -hmm. negative because uh, otherwise, there would be no update. The last term is less than r r square by definition of uh, uh, by the statement of the of the theorem. So, putting all this together, we get the term on this quantity here is less than w t norm square plus r square. But WT norm square came into existence, the WT vector came into existence because there was some weight vector WT minus one on which a mistake was made. Mm -hmm. And it, so I can write it, I can say WT square is less than WT minus one square plus R square again. Mm -hmm. WT minus one square is less than WT minus two square plus R square. So the same sort of induction uh, happens again every time there's a mistake, you're accumulating an R square. Mm -hmm. And so straightforward induction tells you that the norm of W T square is going to be less than, it's actually strictly less than um, T R square. Because there are T times that you'll accumulate. Uh, and for every mistake, you're adding an R square. There are T mistakes, so you're accumulating T times R square. So that takes care of this claim here. After T mistake, W T, square is less than p times r square. 
questions about claim two. Remember, I told you this was a rather simple proof. It is actually a simple proof. It's just, it's a nifty proof. It got a little bit of cleverness that I don't think a lot of people could have invented this, but it's easy to appreciate it once you see it and kind of understand what's going on. In this case, you should not. In this case, you should not, but it's not going to matter. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we are going to take anyway uh, uh, an integer. Uh, of, uh, we're going to count the number of integers. Right? So it's not going to matter. So let's, let's just uh, summarize what we have been able to show. The first claim said after t mistakes, u transpose wt is greater than or equal to t gamma. The second one says after t mistakes, the norm of wt square is less than t r square. At this point, actually, the proof is almost done. Let's see why. From let's take the second uh, expression and just flipping the sign, uh, you know, just flipping the sign and taking the square root. So you know that r times the square root of t is greater than or equal to the norm of t, norm of wt. And this is just from here; it's a straightforward thing. One slightly not straightforward step that comes up is the norm of wt is always greater than or equal to u transpose wt for any unit vector u. Why? I'll give you the hand wavy argument, but then if you want, I'll name a theorem afterwards. What is u transpose wt? It's a dot product between two dot vectors. Mm -hmm. The dot product between two vectors, you know, think about when you first learned about dot product. It is the norm of u times norm of w times cosine the angle between them. Mm -hmm. Norm of u by definition is one because we are assuming that u is a unit vector. Cosine of the angle is strictly less than or equal to one. Mm -hmm. So that means this quantity equals one. This quantity is less than or equal to one. Mm -hmm. That means this thing here is less than or equal to this thing here. This is just by definition of cosine. Mm -hmm. If you really don't like this and you want some fancier sounding names, actually it's an application of the cauchy schwarz inequality. Um, but if you don't like the name cauchy schwarz it's just the definition of the cosine. I mean, um, I don't know why their names to, need to be uh, brought into this mix, but it's what it is. But now we have, but the thing that, that cauchy schwarz slash this box here allows is it connects this quantity which comes from claim two to so this quantity which was in claim one. Mm -hmm. And now let's uh, let's kind of uh, we have all the pieces, let's start wrapping things up. From claim one, we know mm -hmm. that u transpose wt is greater than or equal to t gamma. Right? Mm -hmm. I've just uh, all I've done is put these two claims next to each other, connected them with this inequality here. Mm -hmm. But look at the far left and the far right. There is no W, there's no U, there's no weight vector. The only terms that are there are R, T, and gamma. Mm -hmm. So I can just move things around. So I have R root T is greater than or equal to T gamma. I'll take square on both sides. So I have R square T greater than or equal to T square gamma. Mm -hmm. Let's cancel one T out, so gamma square here. And Bring the gamma to the bottom. Yeah. Or I can just rewrite it as t less than or equal to r square over gamma square. But what was t? t was just a counter of the number of mistakes. This is just saying after t steps. After, and, 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 you know, in both those cases, I, in case I say after t mistakes, this property holds. After t mistakes, that pro property holds. And suddenly, t has to be less than some number that doesn't involve t at all. That means that number is a property that the R square over gamma square is a property of the data. Set. T is less than some number, which is just a property of the data set. But T is just a counter for the number of mistakes. That means the number of mistakes has to be less than R square over gamma square. In other words, the perceptron algorithm cannot make more than these very number of mistakes. We're done.
this counts the number of effects. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I feel when I first saw this, I felt like I was cheated. Somehow I was talking about geometry and suddenly that number of effects about. Um, go over this again. This is not something that uh, uh, I expect you to understand the first time you see it. If you do, that's great. But if you don't, that's fine because I, I want you to kind of go over this argument once again and see if uh, there are questions. Let me restate the mistake bond. Uh, we are, how are we on time? We have five minutes. Um, I'll restate the mistake bond and we'll come back if there are questions. Uh, the mistake bond says if you have a data set with n, n dimensional features and a binary classification task where the labels are minus one and one, and if this, if this data set, so if this task is a linearly separable task, in other words, you have some weight vector u that is a unit vector that perfectly classifies the example with a margin gamma, then running the perceptron algorithm on this data set. On in, notice that we didn't, in the theorem, we didn't really care about the sequence in which the examples are present. Running the perceptron algorithm on, the, on this, on any sequence of examples that represents this data set, this task, after R square over gamma square mistakes, at most those are mistakes, perceptron will never make any more mistakes. In other words, after R square over gamma square mistakes, we can declare that the concept has been learned. R here is a property, it turns out, of the dimensionality. I'm going to leave, uh, I'm going to give you a uh, sort of a simple exercise. If you're, um, if you if you have a Boolean function with n features, then R square is equal to the dimensionality, it turns out. Gamma is the property of the data. How close are the positive and the negative points? If the positive and negative points are really close to each other, then gamma is going to be small because the margin is small. So you need a gap between the positive and the negatives. So the perceptron mistake is bound to say if the dimensionality increases, learning becomes harder. What does it mean to say learning becomes harder? The number of mistakes perceptron makes is going to be equal. If the margin becomes small, learning becomes harder. If the positive and the negative points are very close to each other, it couldn't be hard to find a hyperplane that perfectly separates that. And the mistake bond captures that idea. Because gamma is in the denominator, as gamma goes down, oh, sorry, as, as gamma goes down, the positive and the negative points get closer to each other, the number of mistakes is going to increase. One way to kind of think about this theorem and about R and gamma is to find R and gamma for sort of toy data sets. So, Think, for example, of a disjunction in two dimensions. A disjunction in two dimensions, disjunction in any dimension, is linearly separable. So ask yourself, what would the value of R be and what would the value of gamma? This is sort of a useful exercise to kind of understand what this mistake bound does. So I strongly recommend you do that. You want you to do that for two dimensions, try to generalize that argument to three to n in general. Another exercise is slightly harder. Rather than disjunction, think k disjunction, where only k of the features are relevant. For any k disjunction, you pick some k features and you those are the only relevant ones. So how many mistakes will perceptron make on that? Once again, you need to find r and gamma. r is going to be the same because it's a Boolean function. So R is going to be the number of uh, dimensions. Gamma is going to be different. And uh, it's worth thinking about how to do that. Now, if you want a really hard question, the last one. For a case junction, try to find a sequence of examples that forces order of n mistakes. That's going to take some effort. This is good news and bad news. The good news is the perceptron does not really care about the data distribution. It does not care that your data is sampled from this distribution, this, uh, you know, these, these data points are more likely than that or anything. It could be anything. After seeing the fixed number of mistakes, we don't have to see any more data. After, if we knew the gamma, after making R square over gamma square mistakes, we can be confident that learning is complete because we have this theorem. Of course, there's a big if there. If we knew gamma, how could we possibly know the gamma? I'll let you think about that later. That's the good news. The bad news, really, is uh, in the if part of the theorem. The theorem says if the data set is linearly separable, perceptron will 
is guaranteed to work. Now, the real life is not linearly separable. Nothing, no, there are very precious few problems that are perfectly linearly separable um, uh, in real life. So you can't really expect that the positron algorithm will never make mistakes after a finite number of But what you can do there is uh, add more features, try to make it linearly separable, use tricks like averaging that will kind of smooth things out and get rid of uh, um, noise in a certain sense. In this unit, what you need to know is what is the process processing bound? We need to be able to prove it. We need to be able to prove it not just for this algorithm, but imagine like some variance of Poseidon. You might be called upon. I don't know what uh, real life scenario is going to make you uh, have to prove a Poseidon mistake bound, but uh, you know you should at least for the class you should know how to prove it. This brings us to the end of the Poseidon unit. Uh, it's an online learning algorithm. It's very widely used. It's super easy to implement. It makes additive updates to the weight. It has a neat geometric interpretation. It comes to the mistake bound theorem that we just saw. There are many variants. You should be able to implement it. You should understand what the geometry of it is. You should be able to prove the mistake bound. All right, let's stop. In the next lecture, uh, we will start looking at linear regression. Thanks.